The election victory of the Syriza party in Greece has sent a ripple throughout Europe. The new president Alexis Tsipras had promised his people that he would reform the conditions imposed on Greece by the European Credit Programme because they had destroyed the Greek economy and were seen as a form of repression. For the new finance minister Yanis Varoufakis, the instrument for this subjugation has a name, the Troika. That's why he's demanding a new deal from the German finance minister Wolfgang Schäuble. Europe has an opportunity with our government at the moment. We have been freshly elected. There is an inertia that we're carrying with us from the support that we have from the Greek people for ending the business as usual mentality. And what we are suggesting to our European partners is, you may not like the fact that we were elected because we're a left-wing party, but use us in the context of a European project for turning a page in Greece and turning a page in Europe. It all began here, in Athens, in the spring of 2010. The Greek state was over-indebted and the other Euro countries were determined to avoid a bankruptcy. So the Euro finance ministers kept Greece solvent by granting billions in credits in emergency loans from their state coffers. And in exchange, the Greeks had to surrender to an institution that was never foreseen in any European treaty or constitution. The Troika, a joint undertaking of the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank and the EU Commission. A small group of unelected officials was empowered to radically change a whole country according to the will of the creditors. And to this day, these officials are not accountable to any parliament. For over a year, we researched along the trail of the Troika in Portugal, in Cyprus, Ireland, in Brussels, London and Berlin, in the USA and in Greece. The aim of the Troika programs was to help the crisis countries out of their excessive debts and set their economies back on track for growth. But this didn't work. Public debt is higher than ever before in all of the crisis countries. The economy sank even deeper into recession and millions of people lost their jobs and are in need. Εάν ο Ιβοκράτη ζούσε στι μέρε μα, θα έσκυζε το μανδύα του και βλέπε αυτά με το σύστημα υγεία που γίνονται. Δηλαδή, ναι, εγώ παραδέχομαι ότι ίσω η χώρα μου χρωστάει, οφείλει, πήρε, έφαγε, δεν ξέρω, εμεί δεν τα φάγαμε όμω. So, the only choice I have is if I don't have a, a job in June next year, I have to, to leave. In 30 or 40 years, we will have lost 4 million citizens in, in Portugal. 40% of the whole population. Yes. 60-70% of the people I know have left. 60-70% of your friends have yeah, left? Yeah, gone, yeah, yeah. Gone to Australia and Canada to find work. They can't get it here. But it's sad Ireland uh, is on the rise again. More than 60,000 jobs have been created. Where? No. <laughs> Not in Ireland. No. Well, our politicians kept 60% of the people happy. And they fired 40% out on the road, literally, and said to them, we don't need you anymore. So what went wrong? One person recognized the mistakes of the Troika program very early on, For me, the economist Yanis Varoufakis. In the summer of 2014, he had no idea that he would soon be the finance minister of his bankrupt country. The Troika is uh, visiting our capitals in Dublin and in Lisbon and in Athens and is playing the role of Ebenezer Scrooge when it comes to hospitals. Um, it insists that you know, the cleaning ladies of the Ministry of Finance who are on minimum wages should be fired for the purposes of reducing expenditure. Today, the responsible European leaders, namely the German Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel and her finance minister Wolfgang Schäuble, they claim that there was no alternative to the deep cuts in the Greek budget and the corresponding credits because the deficits were simply too high. If they really wanted to stabilize Greece and stabilize uh, European finance, what they should have done is they should have immediately haircut the Greek government debt. They destabilized finance, they created an, an unsustainable debt problem 
and they turned one proud European nation against the other. This is going to go down in history as one of the most damaging instances in our continent's story. What you say sounds plausible, but on the other hand, also, it sounds a bit like a big conspiracy. It wasn't a conspiracy. It was a very simple operation. How do we stay in power? Mr. Juncker said it. Once he, he admitted, we know what needs to be done. We just don't know how to do it and remain in power. Now, don't forget that before 2008, 2010, all parties of government, whether they were Christian Democratic, Social Democratic, it doesn't matter. They had developed this extremely close relationship with, with the financial sector. There was a kind of Faustian bargain between our politicians and, and bankers. We will let you do what you want. And you will pay us a small amount per proportion in order to fund our states. So when the crisis hit, which was completely unexpected for them, they had neither the analytical power nor the moral authority to go to this bank and say, you know what, you are out. The crisis in Greece came about because for decades, Greek governments spent more than they had revenue. Despite an already high debt ratio, the country initially benefited from falling interest rates when it joined the Eurozone. This led Greek politicians to create thousands of new jobs for their party supporters and to finance prestige projects like the Olympic Games in 2004 with even greater loans, which banks throughout Europe gave without a thought. The sport arenas, which are now falling into decay, cost around 7 billion euros. Even more money was spent on armaments. Greece, a small country, had, in relation to its population, the highest defense budget in the whole of NATO. French and German manufacturers made billions by providing the Greeks with tanks, frigates and submarines, even using bribery to secure those deals. So Germany and France were the winners as far as the Greek debt boom was concerned. But when Greece was finally on the brink of bankruptcy in 2010, the governments in Berlin and Paris didn't care about the shared responsibility of their banks and those who paid the bribes. Smart people in Brussels, especially in Frankfurt and of course in Berlin, knew in May of 2010 that Greece would never repay its debts. What they did was to pretend that the Greek government was not insolvent, but it had a liquidity problem, and to give the largest loan in human history to the most insolvent of states, pretending and extending as if they are uh, third-rate corrupt bankers, was a crime against humanity. Because what it did, it locked Greece into permanent indebtedness that can never be repaid and turned one proud European nation against another because the struggling German worker who is more or less on the poverty line, even though he or she is working eight, ten hours a day, was told by its government that, you know, we are cutting down on your hospitals, but we are giving 110, 230 billion to the Greeks, when it wasn't true that the money was going to the Greeks. This money was never given to any of the Greeks. It was given to the bankers, and most of them, most of this money to French and German bankers. They lied to the Greek people and to the German people. They said to the Greek people, we have avoided bankruptcy. And they said to the German people that the Greeks, they were wayward, now we're going to punish them with austerity, but we will lend them the money because European solidarity demands that. Washington, home of the International Monetary Fund. Their experts are experienced in managing debt crises. That's why the Eurostates brought the IMF on board as a creditor. Decisions about loans are made by the executive directors who represent the member states. However, when Greece was put on the agenda, there was some resistance in the IMF. Paulo Nogueira Batista, executive director for Brazil and member of the 24-person board, speaks for the critics. I don't speak on behalf of the IMF, but in a personal capacity. Back then, when the decision was taken, 
Has it not been under consideration to do a prior debt restructuring, debt reprofiling, debt relief to make the Greek sovereign debt sustainable? Because this would be the economically sensible way to, to manage it. That's the point, for example, I made at the time in our written statement, the one we presented at the board for that first yes. program. Greece would have been better off with an upfront debt restructuring. The big issue that arose at the time in the IMF was because under the rules, this could only be done if the debt could be perceived as sustainable, meaning uh, payable according to schedule. And the IMF staff was very reluctant to say that outright. So what happened, uh, and this was a pretty bad moment for the IMF, was that the, ra the rules were changed to suit the situation. A new, and a new condition was introduced. Oh yes, you, the fund can lend enormous amount of money to a member country, even if the debt cannot be said to be sustainable with high probability. The internal rules of the IMF were changed overnight only because of Greece? What disturbed me uh, at the time in particular was the fact that the rules were changed in a non-transparent manner. In the sense that uh, you, you had to look very carefully at a very extensive report to see that the rules were being changed. I, it, it was not an, an item on the agenda. It was not explicitly on the agenda, so it was a very bad move, I would say. At a cost, at a cost, of course, no? because the cost is reputational. No? But why did the European stage this silent coup at the IMF? The former advisor of EU Commission President Barroso was very close to the decision makers. The IMF staff were overruled by the managing director of the IMF, uh, Dominique Troscan, who had ambitions to be French president and didn't want to impose losses uh, on French banks. And at the same time, German banks furiously lobbied uh, Angela Merkel um, that it, it would be deeply damaging to impose losses on them. Uh, as a result of that, uh, the Eurozone governments decided to pretend uh, that uh, Greece was merely going through uh, temporary funding difficulties uh, and to bypass uh, the legal basis on which the euro was founded, uh, the no bailout rule, uh, and lend money to Greece. Not in order to uh, bail out uh, the Greek government, but in order to bail out uh, the French and German banks uh, that had recklessly lent uh, to an insolvent Greek government. Do you know? the volume, how much money was involved from the German and French bank side? French banks own 20 billion euros worth and German banks 17 billion euros worth. So that's why Greece was prevented from getting immediate debt relief. Those responsible were aware of the implications from the outset. The then Greek delegate at the IMF has the proof. The missing element in this program was uh, uh, debt restructuring. Debt restructuring means debt relief. Or... Debt relief, debt relief and uh, private sector involvement. Yes. So the Europeans had to impose to Greece a very severe uh, fiscal adjustment program for a short period, three to four years. And uh, the uh, fund, the IMF uh, experts, uh, had uh, from the beginning doubts about the uh, success of the program because of this short uh, fiscal adjustment period. I remember that in March 2010, the IMF experts sent an email to the European mm -hmm. Commission. If you want, I can read what the experts yes, were do. saying in March 2010. This adjustment will cause a sharp contraction in domestic demand and an attendant deep recession, severely stretching the social fabric. They were saying that from the beginning. But doesn't this mean that Greece has been sacrificed for the sake of the stability of the global financial markets? I fully agree with you, yeah. This memo proves that they knew beforehand that their program would plunge millions of Greeks in deep need. And this is what they did, actually. In only three years, they cut the expenditures of the Greek state by 15% of uh, the GDP. If this would happen in Germany, 
the federal government would have to cut in only three years the whole federal budget and even more. So this used to be a very busy shopping area. As you can see, uh, every second shop has now gone out of business. It's one of the very few symbols of crisis. No? Usually you don't see it, yeah? It's true that it's, it's difficult to, to locate the crisis, to see the crisis. It's not so visible. And the main reason is that you have an enormous network of solidarity between the people and the families, so it's not very visible. Especially oh, here it's all close, huh? And what's also interesting with this category of people, let's say the middle class, small business owners, is that because their shops have gone out of business, they have become uninsured. So they've lost their access to, for example, to the public healthcare system. They've gone from being middle class people to being, to even gone under the, the borderline of poverty in some cases. Kyria Costa. Hello, good evening. I'll call you Harald. Harald Costas. Costas, isn't it? Mr. Costas apologized for not having any light into, into the store. That it, the store is in this state. How long it is empty? 20 months. 20 months ago. For the rent here, the monthly rent used to be 900 euros. 800, 700. 600, now 500. And even with 500, that is almost half the price, nobody is renting. And this was a very commercial street. Yeah, there are a lot of shops around here. It was a very commercial street. Now, I'm dying. What kind of business they did here? Ruka, Ruka. They were selling clothes, retail for clothes. Ruka, What's the future for this here? What are we going to do with them? Aφού, they say, there's another one, and 400 euros, I'll give it. There's no opportunity. Έτσι. Δεν υπάρχει ζήτηση έξω. Δεν υπάρχουν άνθρωποι να έχουν τα μετέτα. Καλύτερα λοιπόν να το πουλήσετε. Ή ναι, να το χαρίσετε. Να το χαρίσω, ναι, αλλά να το πουλήσετε δεν πουλιέται. Πώ θα το πουλήσω. Οκ. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Ευχαριστούμε. Να είστε καλά. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Για χαρά. Before the crisis, before the austerity took effect, it was possible, I guess, to claim that austerity would actually be good for the economy. There were people making that argument, but now we have, you know, now we have experience. And it's overwhelming the case, overwhelmingly the case that, that austerity, in fact, uh, does cause economies to shrink. Um, and it causes them to shrink by more than one for one. What was the result of that for the European economy? There's a dramatically clear correlation between austerity and economic downturns. The, uh, uh, basically, it, it seems that every, every euro in, in tax increases or, or more important spending cuts, every euro in spending cuts seems to, uh, on average, have cost uh, around 1.3 or 1.5 euros of gross domestic product. And so, so the, the economy just shrunk. even worse. Well, they certainly made the economy shrink, sure. Success story means that the Troika say Greek is a success story. And, and then? These are the numbers of the success story. So 300,000 empty homes, 40,000 unemployed, constant taxes, 3 million uninsured with no access to public health care or to any health care, 50% haircut of the reserves of, of the pension funds, 29% unemployment, 60% unemployment for the young, for the young generation, a sellout for the public assets of the forests and of the coastline, 4,500 suicides. What people find very hard to understand, if I may say what Germans seem to find particularly hard to understand, um, is that the economy is a circle, right? Uh, money flows around. Uh, uh, you buy from me, I buy from you. My spending is your income, your spending is my income. If you say, well, people must spend less, uh, if everybody spends less at the same time, then incomes fall. So when you say uh, where we're going to, the private sector we know is, is over indebted, it's having to cut back. And we're saying, okay, now the public sector also has to cut back. Uh, who is supposed to, you know, who are we selling to? Uh, where, where is, the, this, this cannot work if everyone does it at the same time.
What Paul Krugman means is known as the paradox of thrift. In any economy, one person's expenditure is always someone else's income. Household purchases are earnings for companies, wages paid per companies provide income for households, taxation on companies and households is state revenue. State expenditure, on the other hand, provides income for companies and households. But not everyone can save money at the same time, because saving means taking in more than you spend. That only works if other economic players spend more than they take in and accumulate debt. So if everyone wants to take in more than they spend and nobody wants to get into debt, the revenue sinks for everyone and the economy shrinks. That's what economists call the paradox of thrift. And that's exactly what has happened in the crisis countries. Why then, in spite of this clear evidence you, you, you cite, why then it is done? Germany looks at its experience and says, well, we did austerity in 1999, 2000. We, Germany was actually kind of a troubled economy in the late 1990s, and um, it pulled back, and Germany is doing fine now. And so why can't everyone else do the same? And of course, to, the, to that, the answer is, well, Germany was doing OK because it was able to run massive trade surpluses. And it was able to run massive trade surpluses because there was this great debt financed boom in places like Spain. And uh, now Germany is saying to Spain, you do what we did, but we won't do what you did. We're, we're, you know, it's not risk. But, but Germany, just looking at its own experiences, thinks that austerity works, not realizing that the context matters. <laughs> The Troika often took arbitrary decisions. They forced Greece to do something which the governments who commissioned them would never have done in their own countries. To reduce spending in the health sector down to 6% of the economic output. The average in Europe is 8% and in Germany 10%. At the same time, the economy shrank so drastically that the health budget was cut by 30%. The consequences are disastrous. Around three million people, a quarter of the population, have no health insurance and are without medical care. More than 200 hospitals were closed and half of the 5,000 doctors in the public clinics were laid off. The former government's Minister of Health was not concerned about this. According to the Memorandum of Understanding, the treaty signed by the Greek government and its creditors, the state expenses on healthcare had been cut not to exceed 6% of GDP. This is far below the European average of 8%. Because the figures cannot go forward. This is the reality. I mean, as Greece exiting the crisis, the GDP will increase, and uh, so we'll have more money next year. But you have a lot fewer doctors available to ordinary people. In Formerly the there were more than 5,000 and now there are only 2,000. See what happened. It, it's very easy. They weren't working so much before because they were going there only for three hours. Now they go for seven. So this is how the minister responsible justifies what is in fact a medical catastrophe. Hundreds of thousands can't find doctors in public clinics who will treat them. That's why volunteers all over Greece have set up provisional outpatient clinics in order to alleviate the worst suffering. A hundred volunteer doctors and 200 helpers work in this provisional clinic in Athens in their spare time. Luckily, citizens from Germany and Austria help with donations in an act of European solidarity which their governments refuse to provide. In our media, it has been said the Greek healthcare system is inefficient, has a lot of overcapacity, the doctors are corrupt. That's reported in Germany. It was a democratic system of health that wanted big measures and high measures, but it wanted to be not a catastrophe. Το που συνέβη στη χώρα μας δεν ήταν να φτιαχτεί ένα δημόσιο σύστημα υγείας εκεί που έπασχε και που είχε τα ελαττώματα που ήταν αρκετά. Αυτό που έγινε ήταν ό,τι καλό υπήρχε να το κρεμίσουν 
ε, σήμερα στη χώρα μου, στην Ελλάδα, να μην υπάρχει ουσιαστικά δημόσιο σύστημα υγεία. Εμεί με τι κλήρε είχαμε ένα 67% που παίρναμε από τα κέντρα πιστοποίηση αναπηρία. Αυτό το 67% σήμερα μα το έχουν κάνει 35%. Αυτό το, το 67 που έχει γίνει 35 είναι ότι ε, έχει ένα αποτέλεσμα να μένουν ανασφάλιστοι περισσότεροι. Δηλαδή, αν δεν πάρει το ποσοστό σου, μένει ανασφάλιστο. Οπότε δεν μπορεί να έχει σπίτι, δεν μπορεί να φά. Συγνώμη, είμαστε στη, στη χώρα που γεννήθηκε ο Ιπποκράτη. Είμαστε στη χώρα που μεταλαμβάνονται μεταλαμ, σε όλο τον κόσμο τι σημαίνει ε, η ιατρική. Εάν ο Ιβοκράτη ζούσε στι μέρε μα, θα έσκυζε το μανδύα του και βλέπε αυτά με το σύστημα υγεία που γίνονται. Σε πανελλήνια κλίμακα πεθαίνουν εκατοντάδε άνθρωποι σήμερα. Και όταν λέω εκατοντάδε άνθρωποι, εννοώ κάθε μήνα, όχι εκατοντάδε άνθρωποι σε ένα χρόνο. Και πεθαίνουν και αυτό ο αριθμό δεν καταγράφεται από κανένα. Αλλά το ξέρουμε εμεί οι γιατροί. Γιατί ένα άρρωστο, ο οποίο δεν έχει πρόσβαση στη, 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 στο δημόσιο σύστημα υγεία, είναι καταδικασμένο να πεθάνει. Η Τρόικα πολύ συχνά μας λέει ότι δεν ευθύνομαι εγώ, η ελληνική κυβέρνηση δεν τα κάνει σωστά, η ελληνική κυβέρνηση ή ο, ή ο κάποιος, ο Τάδε ή ο Δίνα υπουργό είναι αυτός ο οποίος δεν έχει κάνει σωστά τη δουλειά του. Εάν διαβάσει όμως κανείς τα μνημόνια, από το πρώτο μέχρι το τελευταίο, θα δει ότι οτιδήποτε έχει συμβεί στον χώρο της υγείας, μα οτιδήποτε έχει συμβεί, ακόμα και στην τελευταία απόλυση, είτε γιατρού είτε νοσηλευτικού προσωπικού, ήταν γραμμένο μέσα στα μνημόνια, ήταν δέσμευση τη Τρόη. Γιατί εφαρμόζονται αυτά τα μέτρα, Είναι επειδή έχουμε οικονομικό πρόβλημα, Είναι επειδή είναι ανίκανοι, Επειδή είναι ανόητοι, Όχι, τίποτα από αυτά δεν είναι. Έχουν μία ιδεολογία. Όποιο έχει χρήματα ζει, όποιο δεν έχει χρήματα πεθαίνει. Είμαστε πολύ! Their protest has now been heard. The new government wants to rebuild the healthcare system. Many of the failures of the Troika policies have been known about for years, also in the European Parliament. But it wasn't until the end of 2013 that Europe's parliamentarians started an investigation. All that came of that was criticism of the legally questionable setup of the Troika. It is working on behalf of the Euro governments, but not in line with the requirements of the EU treaty. So the Parliament had no control over the Troika and for almost four years the MEPs didn't mind. How the Troika officials were using their power was something the conservative majority didn't really want to know. This kind of animal that was created here with the Troikas and all these mechanisms is something completely on the side of the European Union as an institution. It became an intergovernmental arrangement and this shows that in the architecture of the Eurozone, something is missing. Lorsque la Troïka est dans un pays, lorsque, en réalité, il faudrait plus de Troïka, mais lorsque l'Union européenne vient à l'aide d'un État membre et qu'un accord s'établit entre l'État membre et l'Union européenne sur les conditions de l'aide, eh bien, il faut que ces conditions soient bien entendu approuvées dans le Parlement de l'État membre, mais il faut qu'elles soient approuvées au Parlement européen et débattues au Parlement européen. Ça n'est que là qu'on pourra donner une légitimité et surtout une publicité aux discussions. Parce qu'évidemment, pour un fonctionnaire, c'est facile d'aller dire « réduisez les soins de santé en Grèce », parce que lui, il ne paye pas le prix politique de ça. Mais quand le débat se transporte dans une assemblée parlementaire, y compris le Parlement européen, où se trouvent des députés grecs. Ça devient plus délicat politiquement à porter de dire, nous, députés européens, imposant à la Grèce des mesures qui réduisent les soins de santé et qui donc se traduisent très concrètement par plus de maladies, plus de sida, plus de morts. L'austérité littéralement tue. Es kann sein, dass einzelne Maßnahmen 
keinen Sonnenschein am Ende des Tunnels gebracht haben. Aber ohne Troika gäbe es kein Licht am Ende des Tunnels. Ohne der Troika, ohne dem Einschreiten der Europäischen Union wären diese Länder bankrott. Aber natürlich muss man auch schauen, wer die Mehrheit ist im Parlament Europäer. La majorité au Parlement européen était et est encore plus aujourd'hui une majorité de droite qui en fait soutient cette idéologie. The Troika imposed so-called structural reforms on the crisis countries. Here too they followed a simplistic ideology. According to this, people are unemployed because wages are too high or because job protection is too rigid. In Portugal, it became much easier to dismiss employees severance payments were abolished and wages dropped up to 20% and the binding character of collective agreements was dismantled. When the financial crisis began, almost half of the Portuguese workers were under a signed uh, collective contract. Now less than 6% of those workers have a, a social contract. They have only individual contracts. So they are totally vulnerable to all pressure so and to distinctions of wages and so on. The system of collective bargaining has That's been dismantled? Right. Totally, totally. From half to less than one twentieth. This is another social model, you That's may right. call it, another, right. another form to organize the, the, Absolutely. the society. Absolutely. That's the, that's the, the, the case, yeah. This program was meant to stimulate the economy and please the employers. But has it really helped business? Os salários em Portugal não são elevados. Chamo a atenção para o próprio valor do salário mínimo, que em Portugal são 485 euros, e o salário médio da economia estará nos mil e qualquer coisa euros, não. Shouldn't they trust your experience as entrepreneurs here on the ground more than their abstract analysis? Deveriam efetivamente ter a nossa opinião em consideração. De facto, os salários baixos foi uma prática que se utilizou em Portugal para um modelo de desenvolvimento que está ultrapassado. No inquérito que fizemos aos nossos eh, empresários, a reforma laboral aparece em sétimo lugar nas prioridades. Nós o que defendemos, e isso temos-lo dito e dissemos-lo à Troika, é que o modelo de desenvolvimento português tem que assentar em produtos inovadores, em produtos com valor acrescentado e com salários eh, compatíveis com essa inovação e com esse valor acrescentado dos nossos produtos. What exactly did you say when you met with the Troika officials probably? Foi isso que dissemos à Troika, repetimos em todas as avaliações, a Troika limitou-se a escutar, mas tenho que confessar que pouco fez daquilo que nos ouviu sugerir. Sogar der hiesige Präsident des Arbeitgeberverbandes sagte uns, dass die Lohnkosten und, und das Arbeitsrecht eigentlich gar nicht das Problem seiner Mitgliedsunternehmen wären. Viele dieser Arbeitsmarktreformen waren sehr hilfreich äh, für, die Web, für die Wettbewerbsfähigkeit der Unternehmungen. Ähm, aber es ist, geht nicht nur um Arbeitskosten und Arbeitsrecht. Eigentlich sollten die Arbeitsmarktreformen ja dafür sorgen, dass mehr Menschen Arbeit finden. Aber im wirklichen Leben ist dann oft das Gegenteil passiert. Also wir haben zum Beispiel mit dem Fahrer eines großen Transportunternehmens gesprochen. Und er hat erzählt, naja, ich verdiene jetzt viel weniger als vorher. Die Arbeitnehmer schaffen die Möglichkeit, sie hatten die Möglichkeit, zu sehen, dass am Ende des Monats 1300, 1400 Euro, wir sprechen von einem Punkt de partida von 600, das ist der Salario Medio des Motoristen, schaffen sie die Möglichkeit, sehr viel zu verdienen, zu verdienen. Ist denn wenigstens der Arbeitgeber glücklich damit und, und hat jetzt ein gutes Unternehmen und prosperiert und in, investiert in neue Busse oder neue Linien? Nein, no, nicht. No no Wie ich gesagt habe, äh, acaba por estar uma coisa relacionada com a outra. Ou seja, esta redução do pagamento do tempo suplementar não permitiu fazer novas admissões, mas sim 
aumentar mais o volume de trabalho daqueles que existem. Hat nicht dann diese Art von Arbeitsmarktreform, die dafür einfach sorgt, dass die Leute für weniger Geld mehr arbeiten müssen, genau den gegenteiligen Effekt, also senkt Beschäftigung statt steigert Beschäftigung? Das ist was die Wirtschaft schlussendlich braucht, um wettbewerbsfähig zu sein. Aber ich meine, ich hätte in Ihren Berichten gelesen, gerade jetzt hier im, im letzten Review, da stünde drin, also die Löhne sind bisher um durchschnittlich 8 Prozent gesunken, aber sie seien noch nicht genug gesunken. Man muss sich ja überlegen, wenn dann, dann macht Portugal das und dann dann machen die Konkurrenzländer das und so entfaltet sich dann europaweit oder womöglich weltweit so eine Art Lohnsenkungswettlauf, was die Amerikaner Race to the Bottom nennen. Also wo ist denn dann mal Schluss? Also wann verdienen denn die Arbeitnehmer mal wenig genug, dass man sagen muss, also hier muss jetzt mal Schluss sein? In der Situation, in der sich Portugal im Moment befindet, muss die Wettbewerbsfähigkeit des Landes äh, hergestellt werden. work in a travel agency. But this has closed? No, but I was the youngest there, so I was ah, the national choice. The youngest choice. is the first to be dismissed. And now I am unemployed. So. I'm unemployed too. And what was your profession before? Uh, an agronomic engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the uh, jobs I can try to find are uh, less paid than my own uh, unemployment benefit right now. It's uh, unbearable. I, I can't afford to have a, a child and earning 550 euros a month. I barely can afford well, to, to support myself. Everything is around 400 euros, 500 maximum. So yes. what's on offer are jobs for a minimum wage, more or less? Most jobs don't even pay that much. If you're going to see the, the ads you have, if you're going to calculate everything, you won't even get that. It's totally... Uh, common to see a qualified job for 500 euros. Even for an academic? Even for an academic, of course. All the families have invested a lot in what was considered to be, and it was, uh, the most difficult Portuguese problem, that was qualification of uh, human resources. Mm -hmm. So we invested in university degrees, and we made huge progress, but all of a sudden there is no jobs for any of those uh, youngsters. Even if they are highly qualified? Particularly if they are highly qualified. Uh, and then, because you are squeezing wages at the same time, you don't invest, there are no jobs, so they just immigrate. So this is a pure brain drain, and we are killing the conditions for future growth. In one more year or two more years, we will have 10% of the working force, mostly the most qualified, out of the country. Yeah. And that's a demogra demographic tragedy. And if it goes on for several years, then the projections of the National Institute of Statistics is that Portugal would go back to 6 million. Uh, um, from so 10 from million. 10 million to, to 6 million. That would mean uh, the average population of the, big, the, the end of the 19th century. The Troika policies are driving citizens out of their country. They are queuing up outside the consulates. Yet the Troika could have acted quite differently. For example, limit the exorbitant profits made by private operators of bridges and motorways. But in that area, nothing of importance happened, Carlos Moreno tells us, former judge at the Court of Auditors. And when Portugal's Constitutional Court declared the austerity program unconstitutional, the judges were labeled political activists by the EU Commission. Lawyer and parliamentarian Isabel Moreira is enraged by this. In Ireland too, the model country for the Troika, it is the ordinary people who have to pay the price. Meanwhile, as Irish economist James Stewart told us, companies like Apple or Google are raking in around 31 billion euros of untaxed profit in 2011 alone. The powerful are being looked after. It is the ordinary people who have to carry the burden. The Troika ordered mass redundancies in Greece. So also the 595 cleaning ladies who worked for the tax authorities were laid off. They have been protesting against this for months because it doesn't even save money, just provides profit for private cleaning services. In addition, the minimum wage was cut drastically, under duress. When I came to the Labour Ministry, it was evident that they had already negotiated and agreed a set of measures with my predecessor to actually dismantle uh, collective agreements 
and promote flexibility uh, of the labor markets without any security. You said they wanted the complete dismantling of all collective agreements? It's exactly this, an abolition of social dialogue against international conventions, against the ILO, the International, the labor, international labor, organization. labor Organization, and against, of course, what is going on in Germany and other countries. What is the rationale behind this? They wanted, it was cleared, for employers to have completely the upper hand to be able to set the wage. But wouldn't this have meant also that there is no further purpose for trade unions? They went even further and they said it's not enough. We want the government to be able to impose the, the uh, terms of uh, both for the minimum wage and for wage settlements. So that the government has now every right to this, impose conditions. But that is a new of form of a central planning economy. That's exactly what that has happened. And this is the reason that now social dialogue in Greece is dead. Κοιτάξτε, νομίζω ότι υπήρχε η άποψη της Τρόικα αλλά και της κυβέρνησης και του τότε Πρωθυπουργού, του κύριου Παπαδήμου, ο οποίος ε, υποστήριζε ότι ο κατώτατος μισθό των 751 ευρώ ακαθάριστα ήταν πολύ υψηλός σε σχέση με το επίπεδο παραγωγικότητας της ελληνικής οικονομίας και επομένως έπρεπε να μειωθεί. Ε, τα συνδικάτα αλλά και οι εργοδότες διαφωνούσαν. Υπάρχει ένα, με, με ένα μνημόνιο προς την τότε κυβέρνηση, είναι ακριβώς αυτό εδώ το κείμενο, το οποίο το έχουν υπογράψει όλοι οι κοινωνικοί εταίροι, εδώ βλέπετε. Της Αθεν, Φεβρουαρί του 2012, είναι ο Πρωθυπουργός Λουκάς Παπαδήμος και προς τους όλους αρχηγούς των, των κομμάτων, ε, όπου τους λένε ότι δεν πρέπει να μειωθεί ο κατώτατος μισθός από το 751 στο 586. Ε, αυτό δεν ελήφθηκε υπόψη. Ο κατώτατος μισθός μειώθηκε. Έγινε με πράξη νομοθετικού περιεχομένου και δεν πέρασε μέσα από το Ελληνικό Κοινοβούλιο. It was not voted by the Parliament. Δεν πέρασε από το Ελληνικό Κοινοβούλιο γιατί ίσως φοβόταν ότι οι βουλευτές δεν θα το ψηφίσουν. This reduction from 4,41 euro to 3 euro 44 cents per hour pushed three and a half million households into even deeper poverty. The new government now wants to return to the old rate. Hello? Living room? TV. Perfect. Wenn Sie sich die Entwicklung in Griechenland ansehen, so hat unter anderem, nicht nur, aber unter anderem der exzessiv hohe Mindestlohn dazu geführt, dass im exponierten Sektor, im exportorientierten Sektor, es fast keine Beschäftigung mehr gab. Natürlich waren die Gewerkschaften dagegen. Aber das Interessante war, auch sämtliche Arbeitgeberverbände Ich glaube, das sehen Sie falsch. Der zuständige Arbeitsminister wollte es dann auch nicht machen und hat uns berichtet, dass dann eben die Vertreter der Troika in der gemeinsamen Kabinettssitzung gesagt haben, also entweder ihr macht das oder wir zahlen die nächste Tranche nicht aus. Das war Politik per Erpressung. Ist sowas nicht auch ein Machtmissbrauch? Die Behauptung, dass der griechische Mindestlohn keinerlei ökonomischen Auswirkungen hatte und seine Beseitigung oder seine Senkung negative ökonomischen Auswirkungen hätte, ist absoluter Unsinn. Da werden Sie von den griechischen Kollegen ganz einfach in das Licht geführt. Naja, also wenn das nur Gewerkschafter wären, dann wäre ich ja auch selber misstrauisch. Aber wenn es auch die ganz normalen, wenn man so will, Bankökonomen oder Ökonomen der, der Unternehmerverbände sind, die sagen, das hat uns nicht genutzt, das hat alles nur schlimmer gemacht, dann komme ich doch ins Zweifel. Also ich habe sowohl vom griechischen Finanzminister als auch von einer ganzen Reihe von griechischen Ökonomen was anderes gehört. Lohnfestsetzung, Tarifverträge, das Arbeitsmarktreform, Arbeitsmarkt 
Arbeitsmarktliberalisierung war ja in allen Krisenländern oder ist in allen Krisenländern Teil der Sanierungsprogramme. Und das Interessante daran ist, dass ja im geltenden europäischen Vertrag festgelegt ist, dass die EU-Kommission genau für das, nämlich Lohnfindung und Tarifverträge und Collective Bargaining, nicht zuständig ist. Wie kann es sein, dass dieselben Kommissionsbeamten, die als Kommission dafür nicht zuständig sind, als äh, Vertreter in der Troika sich mit dem Ding befassen also, und dort eigentlich das Gegenteil tun von dem, was ihnen der EU-Vertrag aufträgt. Ist das nicht Vertragsbruch im Auftrag der Eurogruppe? Jetzt stelle ich Ihnen, ich nehme an, Sie wissen es genau und äh, stellen daher äh, eher suffisanterweise diese Frage. Äh, all das, was in diesen äh, Krisenländern passiert ist, war ja nicht äh, eine Aktivität im Rahmen des normalen EU-Gesetzgebungsverfahrens, sondern waren Maßnahmen, die im Rahmen der Eurogruppe, im Rahmen der Eurozone erfolgt sind. Und sie waren dort nicht als legislatives Organ oder legislativ vorbereitendes Organ, sondern als Experten für die Eurogruppe unterwegs. According to the EU Treaty, is it possible to, to, to differentiate it as the same person in these two different roles? No, I would definitely say no. The Commission is a guardian of the treaty. The Commission always has to have to respect the treaty. It's not because the Commission is part of the Troika that it can say, oh, well, we, we put the treaty aside because we're part of the Troika and the Troika can do this and that. No, it can't. The Commission should, in all circumstances, respect the treaty. And for me, it's very clear that they didn't. Which says that was only one of the many encroachments into the grey area of legality. In Athens, the Troika officials even behaved as if they were legislators and they blackmailed the ministers. Look at this. Dear minister, we have serious problem. Text is not acceptable. <laughs> Key indispensable provisions are absent. Very many comments proposals have been ignored. Look here. Completely lined out and redrafted. And they would s scratch it out and put a new text. Mm -hmm. And then we would have to go back and forth so the they text. were not just commenting on no, drafts from your ministry, drafts they, they, and they draft and redrafts and, and redrafts as... Even the last word, except that we were elected officials and they were bureaucrats and technocrats. Δεκατρεις μήνες έμεινα υπουργός, όλη μου το είναι και η φροντίδα και η έννοια ήταν πώς θα γίνουν οι διαπραγματεύσεις με την Τρόικα. How did they treat you as the elected minister? As pume egviaze, sinechiasta nomno ti i chora mu ta pinonotan. Afto pui pena ena vradi pume fonaxe si sede kajora ya si zitisi. Apo sena exartate. This was only because the IMF and Mr. Thompson needed a symbol of defeat. Yes. And the fear. And the fear. The fear. Τον φόβο ήθελε. Και την υποταγή. Δεν σε βότανε ότι είχε έναν υπουργό απέναντί του μιας κυριαρχής χώρας. Μου έδινε την εντύπωση στην negotiation ότι εγώ ήμουν ο εκπρόσωπος μια χώρα που δεν ήταν απλώ ο φιλέτη, αλλά ήταν μια φαυλοκρατική χώρα. Ε, μια χώρα τεμπέλιδων. Εγώ πιστεύω ότι ο Τόμψεν το πήρε προσωπικά αυτό το θέμα. Yeah. Και ήθελε και εκδίκηση να πάρει και ταπείνωση να κάνει και να δικαιώσει τον εαυτό του. The worst thing that can happen to a country is to fall into the hands of and into international bureaucracies that know better what they, the country needs to do. No? Mm -hmm. And for example, even to this day, the extent of intervention in, in Greece is amazing. The Troika has designed a program for Greece that is such a detailed program. It's a complete government program. Isn't it generally very risky to grant so much power to unelected officials? who are not accountable to any parliament, 
they can do what they want. I think that's a big, big issue. It's, it's a big issue in the context of Europe because you have these, what De Gaulle called the technocratie apatride, uh, in Brussels taking decisions, unelected officials. You have here in Washington international bureaucracies. bureaucracies. I'm not excluding myself there. We're so distant from the problems. I have never been to Greece, so I haven't seen the problems in the field. I wish I could go to Greece. I'm ready to go as soon as I have an opportunity. But you don't really feel the problems of the country, of the countries, when you're in a protected environment like Washington or Brussels. Huh? And this is a dangerous situation for a country to have so many of its decisions, crucial for the future of its citizens, in the hands of people that are not in touch. The Troika looks the other way when it comes to favoring the elites. In October 2010, the French finance minister Christine Lagarde handed her Greek colleague a list with more than 2,000 names of Greek citizens who held accounts at the Swiss branch of the HSBC. In this one bank alone, wealthy Greeks had hidden more than 2 billion euros. But both the Greek minister and the Troika officials kept the existence of this list a secret and thereby prevented investigations. In 2012, an insider passed this list on to a journalist for publication. Since then, it is known as the Lagarde List. Today, Christine Lagarde is director of the IMF. The list of Lagarde, as we call it in Greece, came to the country in 2010, September. How many of these potential tax evaders have been prosecuted until today? Είναι 2062 συνολικά τα ονόματα. Το Γενάρη του 2014, ο επικεφαλής του ΔΟΕ, που είναι στενός φίλος του Πρωθυπουργού, μας είπε ότι είχαν ολοκληρωθεί οι έλεγχοι μόνον σε έξι. Απαράδεκτο, αδιανόητο αποτέλεσμα, το οποίο όμως είναι ευεξήγητο, διότι μέσα στη λίστα αυτή, στους καταθέτες αυτούς, βρίσκονται πολιτικά πρόσωπα, συγγενείς πολιτικών προσώπων, μια σειρά προσώπων συνδεδεμένων με αυτό που συνιστά το σύστημα της διαπλοκής στην Ελλάδα του σήμερα. But was it not one of the main objectives of the Troika's reform program for Greece to stop the tax evasion of the rich? It was only on paper. It was only on paper. And what was a very stunning revelation during the procedures before the committee investigating the Lagarde list case was the fact that uh, the IMF official who was permanently installed at the Ministry of Finance during the time basically discouraged the public officials from looking more into the uh, case and looking more into the list. Das mit dem Mindestlohn wurde mit eiserner Hand durchgesetzt. Warum wurde nicht mit der gleichen eisernen Hand durchgesetzt, dass die Liste der potenziellen Steuerhinterzieher, die Frau Lagarde persönlich mal übergeben hat, wirklich verfolgt werden? Die griechischen politischen Präferenzen haben das griechische Steuersystem produziert, so wie in Deutschland, so wie in Dänemark, so wie in Frankreich. Mhm. Und die Steuerverwaltung war, wie sie war. Das wird in den Krisenländern als extrem ungerecht empfunden, dass, dass unterm Strich diejenigen, die oft sogar als Steuerhinterzieher die Krise mit verursacht haben, durch die Privatisierung und durch die Steuerstruktur dann nochmal begünstigt werden. Warum konnte man da nicht eingreifen? Das ist in der Tat natürlich eine äh, Entwicklung, die unerfreulich ist äh, und hängt auch mit der Reife des politischen Systems, mit den Umständen der Krise äh, etc. zusammen. In fact, the people responsible in the Troika didn't care at all who was going to suffer through their programs and who was going to benefit. This is particularly true for the enforced privatization. In all crisis states, the Troikans insisted that as many state assets as possible should be sold off very quickly. And this opened to all kind of speculators the opportunity to make a killing at the cost of the taxpayer. The Greek state even founded a privatization fund which sells off everything from ports to airports, whatever the state owns. And look, this runs like eBay. Everything is for sale. 
plots of land, whole beaches, parts of towns, areas for vacation, whatever you want. This just opens the doors to manipulation. For example, when assets worth billions are put up for auction and there's only one bidder. The development of Hellenicon is expected to benefit the local and wider economy, attracting more than 7 billion euros of investment to reinvigorate Athens, Greece and overall tourism. This is how the winners of one of the largest privatization deals advertise their project. The marketing of Elenikon, the site of the former Athens airport and later the expensive stadiums for the Olympic Games. This piece of land is three times as large as Monaco, four kilometers of coastline and beach. It is close to the center and very desirable building land. Yet the secretly operated trust fund Taipit geared the auction in such a way that only one bidder remained the firm Lambda, part of a group of companies belonging to the Greek oligarch Spiros Latsis. They got land, which officially is valued at one and a quarter billion euros, for less than half that price. It's looting. It's, it's actually, uh, unfortunately, a small uh, group is looting the country. There's only one bidder. But it is a privatization it's process where there's only one bidder. Usually, if you have only one bidder, you would interrupt the process and say, OK, we sell it two years right. later. But uh, not in Greece, under the Troika. In Greece, under the Troika, uh, the government allows it to go on. And uh, the buyer, of course, uh, will reap tremendous profits. The man responsible for this is the former finance minister Giannis Donadas. Wouldn't it have been better in these cases to stop the process and wait for a later time and development instead of selling it away for a bargain price? I, I don't believe in delaying decisions. Uh, now is the time to, to, to uh, take decisions, to proceed with privatizations, to make, to, to make uh, the Greek economy a normal economy again. What is the interest of the other Euro countries to support looting of Greek assets? Γιατί είναι αυτή η επιδίωξή τους, γιατί υπηρετούν μεγάλα επιχειρηματικά συμφέροντα που αξιοποιούν την ευκαιρία της κρίσης για να αρπάξουν τον πλούτο της χώρας μας. Γιατί είναι τόσο εξευτελιστικό το τίμημα, το ποσό που θα εισπράξει, που νομίζω αναλογεί σε κάτι μέρες ή κάτι μήνες, ας πούμε, τον, του χρέους που έχουμε για να αποπληρώσει συνεπώ. Many Greek we talk to um, see this as the, our country is for sale for bargain prices to foreign investors. It's given away for nearly nothing. For example, the huge Hellenicon area, three times uh, the area of Monaco. Uh, I have a, susp a suspicion that you're yes. making your calculations wrong because uh, you don't take into account the amounts that the, the investor will invest. But you do it against the resistance of the affected population. For every euro, Invested in in Elinico, five more euros um, will be created in the in the Greek economy through through the multiplier effect. Αυτά που ακούγονται για δημιουργία 50.000 θέσεων εργασίας μας φαίνονται τελώς αστήρικτα να πω κάτι σαν παραμύθι. Δεν τεκμηριώνεται πουθενά. Is the contract itself being public? Δεν γνωρίζουμε το περιεχόμενο. Και μάλιστα πρέπει να πούμε ότι κατ' επανάληψη έχει ζητηθεί και από εκπρόσωπους του κοινοβούλιου της χώρας μας να δημοσιοποιηθούν κάποια δεδομένα και κάποια στοιχεία αυτής της διαδικασίας έτσι ώστε να μπορεί να κρίνει ο, ο κόσμος. Και η απάντηση που δίνει είναι ότι το ΤΑΙΠΕΔ είναι μια εταιρεία που διέπεται από τους ιδιωτικού όρους της οικονομίας και δεν είναι υποχρεωμένη να δημοσιοποιήσει αυτά τα στοιχεία. But who then benefits from the sale of the Hellenicon area? Who are those investors? Ο κύριος Λάτσης, που μέσω της Lambda Development φαίνεται να αποκτά το ελληνικό, ο κύριος Λάτσης όμως είναι ταυτόχρονα ε, το πρόσωπο που υπήρξε ο ιδιοκτήτης, ας το πούμε έτσι, της Eurobank, είναι ταυτόχρονα ο ε, συνδεδεμένος με τον όμιλο EFG, ο οποίος ε, συνδέεται με την ε, ε, μεγαλύτερη τραπεζική κατάθεση, μη διαλευκανθήσα 
κατάθεση που εμφανίστηκε στη λίστα Lagarde. Why does the Troika not intervene in this process? They could, or couldn't they? Η Troika ουσιαστικά συμπράττει με αυτήν την εγκληματική πολιτική σε βάρος του δημοσίου συμφέροντος, σε βάρος των Ελλήνων πολιτών, σε βάρος της ελληνικής κοινωνίας και θα σας πω και σε βάρος των επόμενων γενεών. The Elenicon deal is not an isolated case. Citizens in all the crisis countries are losing billions through the sale of state property which actually belongs to them. Everything is being sold off, even the waterworks, whilst in Germany and France the privatization of these have been stopped and reversed. The same companies that have been chucked out elsewhere are now about to take them over. They are grabbing what they can of Greece's family silver, says activist Maria Canelopoulou, who is opposing the sale. In Portugal too, the recently modernized water supply companies are about to fall into the hands of the same corporations, warns José González, head of a regional waterworks. They will hardly have to invest anything for 10-15 years, but will immediately reap great profits. Só se vendem as joias das famílias por razões de sobrevivência. Para mim, é o castigo total. Cortam os ordenados, aumentam os impostos, a escola pública está menos, está pior, o Serviço Nacional de Saúde tem muitas dificuldades, a segurança social corta em tudo o que pode, o desemprego é enorme, etc, etc mas depois as boas empresas são vendidas sem bem sabermos como, porque não nos foi completamente explicado a quem já é realmente quase dono do mundo. Wäre es nicht sinnvoll, einfach damit die Leute das Gefühl haben, ihre, sie werden in ihren Sorgen auch ernst genommen, den Wasserbereich auszunehmen? Das ist eine Entscheidung der Regierung hier und äh, der gewählten Vertreter hier. Ja. Äh, so. Das ist Aber das müssten Sie doch dann wenigstens nicht noch unterstützen. Ich meine, in Ihren Reviews, die Sie alle drei Monate veröffentlicht haben in den letzten drei Jahren, stand es jedes Mal mit drin, ja, die Wasserprivatisierung. Muss ja, da muss man, muss, man, muss man ja auch genauer hinschauen. Aber äh, generell, äh, Privatisierung, die Erfahrung ist, dass, es ein, dass, die, dass diese Unternehmen dann effizienter betrieben werden. Die bisherige Erfahrung beweist das Gegenteil. Ausgerechnet im Mutterland der Wasserprivatisierung läuft jetzt der große Rollback, nämlich in Frankreich. Weil die, einfach, weil die Gemeinden durch die Bank schlechte Erfahrungen gemacht haben. Klar, aber ich bin mir sicher, dass diese Erfahrungen, die in anderen Ländern gemacht wurden, hier sozusagen berücksichtigt werden. Es sind die gleichen Unternehmen, die hier wieder beteiligt sind, die auch woanders schon schlecht gewirtschaftet haben. Darum habe ich da meine Zweifel. Aber ein Sonderfall der Privatisierung ist die Bank PPN. Die wurde ja wegen des drohenden Bankrotts 2008 verstaatlicht, um eine Bankenpanik zu verhindern. Wahrscheinlich sogar vernünftig, weil das war damals eine knifflige Lage im Herbst 2008. Und das kostete dann den portugiesischen Staat rund 5 Milliarden Euro. Und dann stand plötzlich im Memorandum of Understanding im, im Juni 2011, also im Vertrag der Troika mit der Regierung, dass die Bank schon einen Monat später verkauft werden soll. Was hatte diese Klausel in dem Vertrag zu suchen. Also warum schreibt man in einem Memorandum of Understanding, dass eine ganz bestimmte Bank bis einen Monat später verkauft sein muss? Zu diesem Thema, ich, ich würde sozusagen nicht so gern jetzt äh, kommentieren auf äh, spezifische äh, ja. Fälle. Okay, dann bedanke ich mich sehr für das Gespräch. Okay, vielen Dank. Dankeschön. It's obvious that something was definitely amiss with the sale of the BPN Bank, which the Troika promoted. It was bought by the Angolan financial concern BIC. It's surely not a coincidence that its Portuguese branch is run by an ex-minister of the currently ruling party. But no one is prepared to give information about the circumstances of this sale. 
Nobody from the EU Commission's responsible department was ready to speak about this, nor was any representative from the Portuguese government. However, the parliament did set up a committee of inquiry where the opposition politician Jean Semedo disclosed amazing details. There is one very strange clause in the Memorandum of Understanding between the Portuguese government and the Troika of the creditor countries. It says that the government is obliged to sell the bank PPN only a bit more than a month after the memorandum was uh, signed. Did you find out why this condition was put in the MOU? O governo aceitou porque, na nossa convicção, o governo já tinha pré-escolhido o comprador. This is very strange because this, this clause signaled potential buyers that the state had to sell at any price. Yes. Uh, so the negotiation position of the state was nil. O governo português ainda fez pior, porque o concurso que abriu muito rápido eliminou outros candidatos, Why? o governo português, por razões exclusivamente políticas, quer ter boas relações com a finança angolana e por isso fez uma operação de venda por 40 milhões, não é nada para um banco, com tantos balcões, agências. One of the main owners is the daughter of the Angolan president. president. E sabemos que a filha do presidente do governo uh, de, do Estado angolano, da República de Angola, uh, tem sido, uh, muitas vezes, associada a práticas ilícitas uh, relacionadas com uh, os fluxos financeiros dos mais variados tipos e naturezas. E how much money the Portuguese state has lost with this deal? Pelo Como? menos 5 mil milhões de euros. 5 billion euros. 5 billion euros. Why did the Troika support this absurd uh, money wasting scheme? Porque o governo que assinou o acordo com a Troika, o governo português criou a ilusão de que a venda do BPN impedia que o Estado continuasse a perder dinheiro com o BPN, o que não é verdade. Ainda hoje o Estado perde dinheiro, já não com o BPN, mas com o lixo tóxico But how is it que saiu. Possible? Esse lixo continua a existir em três sociedades. These separated bad banks, you may call yes, it. bad banks. Uh, yeah. Que o Estado criou para guardar o, o lixo tóxico do BPN. Mm -hmm. É de facto um escândalo, é uma situação absolutamente escandalosa como é que foi possível que o, a Troika tivesse constituída pelas organizações que a constituem, autorizado um negócio absolutamente ruinoso. This would mean that the Troika's institutions would help to cover up dubious, maybe even corrupt relationships. A Troika argumentará sempre, dirá sempre, que isto é da responsabilidade do Estado português. Nunca assumirá que a decisão de venda do banco tenha sido da responsabilidade da Troika. The surprising thing is that in Greece too, the Troika forced the government to sell the nationalized banks at a loss of billions. After the failure of the first program for Greece, the governments of the other Euro states had to admit that the Greek state would go bankrupt without a substantial debt relief. So in 2012, they forced Greece's private creditors, that means banks and investors, to grant a debt relief of 108 billion euros. But because they had waited for two years, this hit above all the Greek banks and not the German, French or other foreign banks. So the Greeks had to borrow another 50 billion euros in new debt right away to prevent their banks from collapsing. Since then, the four big Greek banks have in effect been nationalized. But the Troika is forcing Greece to sell the banks again as quickly as possible, no matter what price. This has absurd consequences. For example, the fund company of John Paulson, one of the leading American hedge fund managers, reports that in the first quarter of 2014, it has made nearly 6% profits only with Greek bank shares. 
how much of the money will flow back to the state coffers when the banks are sold again to private investors? A fraction only, about two thirds. Two thirds? That is a pretty good estimate of the disaster that we have in our hands. The Troika is turning a blind eye to the Greek recapitalization process. It is either complicity or idiocy. And because I believe that the people who are represented from the Troika in Athens well educated. are very smart folks, I turned to come down on the side of, com of complicity. What I do not understand is why those same banks who have been de facto nationalized for a certain period of time now are sold at bargain prices to American investors who now claim they have made a killing with Greek banks and the Greek state is going to make a huge loss with this bank recapitalization and at the same time there's not enough money to take care for ill people. You have got the, the priorities wrong. No, no, not at all. Uh, don't forget that um, the negative worth of Greek banks was due to the fact, uh, to the PSI, uh, to, uh, to the reduction of debt. So the contribution of the banking sector in the reduction of debt was a huge one. So you, you have to take this into account. But why it is necessary to produce profits for American hedge funds via Greek banks? It, it is not necessary. This, this is markets. Uh, we don't say we don't, we don't produce profits. I mean, these investors, they look at profits, they look at risks, and they decide. So this is how markets are working. I mean, we don't live in a, in a Soviet system anymore. Also, wenn ich sehe, was der griechische Staat für die Aktie der Eurobank bezahlt hat und was dann irgendwie äh, amerikanische Fonds für dieselbe Aktie bezahlt haben, dann schüttel ich den Kopf und denke, das kann doch gar nicht wahr sein. Also ich meine, wo jeder Euro gebraucht wird, kann man doch nicht einfach so mal eben kurz ein paar Milliarden. Ich glaube, das sehen Sie falsch, dass dort irgendwie Geld mutwillig irgendjemanden in den Rachen geschoben wurde. Es war ganz einfach, im Zustand des Meltdowns des griechischen Finanzsystems äh, ist unfassbar viel Geld verloren worden. Das ist überhaupt keine Frage. I spoke about this with Theodoris Pantalakis, who used to be the CEO of one of the nationalized banks. And I asked him, why weren't the Greeks allowed to do what the Americans did? To hang on to the nationalized banks until they can be sold at a profit. He said that would have been possible. That means Greece is losing 15 billion euros because the Troikans think that Greece must not have state-owned banks. This is the same amount that has been cut from the Greek public health care system since 2010. So I asked Mr. Pantelakis why, and his answer was... <laughs> It is precisely because of this willing submission to the power of the creditors that the Greeks voted against their old government. And the new one now has to negotiate how to stop this sellout and many other things beside. Cyprus was the last country that had to be bailed out in the spring of 2013 because the banks had lost their money through their loans to Greece. But this time, in contrast to the previous bailouts, the other Euro governments forced the depositors and creditors of the banks to pay for the losses. But then, something strange happened. The Cypriot banks had to sell their Greek branches at an extremely low price to one particular Greek bank and three weeks later, that bank was able to book a profit of 3.4 billion euros. That's why many Cypriots feel that they were cheated of this money. When Cyprus needed emergency loans from the other Euro countries in March 2013, the Troika said as a condition the sale of the Greek branches of the Cypriot banks. What did that mean for the Cypriots? 
that meant that immediately the two biggest banks in Cyprus became insolvent. How that? Because uh, we gave away the branches in Greece for free. They were worth four billion, but uh, a decision was taken essentially on the European uh, level, on the European Union level, to uh, force us to sell those branches for 500 million. So when this decision was taken, we lost three and a half uh, billion euros. That meant that um, the bank that got the branches, Piraeus Bank, uh, made a profit of three and a half uh, billion euros. Uh, these losses were immediately borne by the Cypriot uh, depositors of the banks, whereas the Greek depositors of the Cypriot branches did not suffer any consequences. Who exactly took this decision? The Eurogroup. The Troika, the Troika in Greece, and the Troika in Cyprus, together with the central banks. This has been done on purpose? Intentional? It was done uh, with intention because of somebody decided on a political level that uh, Cyprus was much, much uh, less important than Greece. That would mean that the Eurogroup decide on purpose to expropriate Cypriots and transfer the wealth to the Greek side? They took the money from the Cypriot depositors and they gave it to a Greek bank. That is precisely what happened. In my view, it's one of the biggest uh, scandals in the history of the Eurozone. Some people made billions out of this transaction. But didn't also the, the, the Cypriot parliament and the Cypriot government agree to this deal? Yes, with a gun to our head. We were forced to agree to this deal because we were bankrupt. But what you say is a very strong allegation against the responsible ministers from the other Euro countries and the ECB and the Commission. Let me just be very clear. What happened in Cyprus was uh, daylight robbery, but on a state level. And I repeat, some people made billions out of this transaction. Piraeus Bank, of course. The owner of uh, Piraeus Bank, Mr. Uh, Salas, had non-performing loans with one of the banks that was sold over 150 million in, in loans. Those loans were written off after the transaction. So we gave them our money. It's as simple as that. What do you know about the role of the European Central Bank in this process? I think that their role is quite questionable and it should be investigated. This is a very strong allegation. If this is only in parts true, it would be enough to give the Cypriots the right to get a compensation for this. And I think the, the officials from the ECB, the Commission, and the Eurogroup's finance minister have to answer very stark questions. Sie haben Klage eingereicht beim Europäischen Gerichtshof in Luxemburg. In Luxemburg, genau. Die Klienten, die Sie vertreten, um welche Summe geht es denn da? Was haben die an Geld verloren? Insgesamt handelt es um über 100 Millionen Euro. Und von diesen 100 Klienten oder 120 Klienten, die Sie haben, sind das Unternehmen oder einfach nur reiche Leute? Einfache Leute, würde ich sagen. Und natürlich auch Unternehmen. Ja. Aber einfache Leute wie zum Beispiel Pensionierte die ihre Pensionssumme, die sie am Pension bekommen hatten, bei den Banken gespart hatten. Was werfen Sie den europäischen Institutionen vor? Dass die europäischen Institutionen gegen das europäische Recht äh, gehandelt haben. Ich meine, die Eurogruppe, die Europäische Zentralbank, äh, die Kommission und der Rat. Die, äh, insbesondere, die haben gegen die Charta der Grundrechte der Europäischen Union gehandelt und natürlich, sie haben auch gegen das Prinzip der Gleichheit oder das Prinzip der Nichtdiskriminierung gehandelt. Welche Rolle Aber spielte dabei die Europäische Zentralbank? Herr Asmussen hatte gesagt, wenn die Zyprische Republik nicht ein Rettungsprogramm mit der Europäischen Union macht vor dem 21. März, dann würde die Finanzhilfe die Finanzierung der zyprischen Banken gestoppt. Mhm. Wie kann die Europäische Zentralbank eine politische 
einen politischen Hinweis gegenüber einem Mitglied der Europäischen Union machen. Das heißt, Sie meinen, die Europäische Zentralbank in Person Ihres Vizepräsidenten Asmussen habe europäisches Recht gebrochen? Rechtswidrig gehandelt. We left the negotiations, we said we cannot deal with this, there is no way yeah. uh, we can do that. And then there was arbitration done uh, by Almunia's team in uh, Brussels. We, who then was the commissioner? The competition. And then uh, the decision was taken and that meant they showed a profit of three billion overnight. Yes, but it meant that on the Greek side, a bank which was insolvent was overnight rescued. Isn't that very, very unjust? Yes, and they put it to us very, very bluntly. Uh, the alternative was we either agreed to this program, meaning that we would have a haircut of depositors and, of course, um, all kinds of other uh, elements of, of the program, or basically we would have to leave the Eurozone. That meant a full catastrophe for the economy. So in a very, very real sense, uh, this was uh, uh, do or die. There's a strong indication that the accusation is true, that the ECB and the EU Commission handed over billions to the Greek side. This email by an official from the European Commission is evidence that they demanded this extremely low selling price. And this calculation was the basis on which the decision was made by the European Council, which gave the Cypriot minister no other choice than to accept the terms and sell. And as a consequence of this deal, only a month later, the buyer, the Greek bank Piraeus, could report in its quarterly results that its equity has increased by 3.4 billion euros. And they even say it that it was because of the acquisition of the Cypriot assets, because otherwise the Piraeus Bank would have been insolvent. Did the Troika collude with the Greek bank? This suspicion is now even being investigated in the board of the Central Bank of Cyprus. You talk about 10% of the country's GDP that was transferred outside Cyprus through this sale. <laughs> it, it, it is mess. I mean, the public wants transparency. Mistakes were made. Someone has to pay the price. But it seems the price that was decided uh, was excessive and it was paid by the smaller player in mm -hmm. the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is not enough information to judge if mistakes were made or if there was corruption. So these questions, these question marks, cannot be hanging over European institutions. So I think it's more important that there is some, at the European level, an investigation of what went wrong. Werden Sie sich denn jetzt im neuen Parlament, was ja gerade gewählt worden ist, für weitere Untersuchungen von zurückliegenden Fällen einsetzen? Es gab keine Untersuchung und es wird keinen Untersuchungsausschuss geben, weil es keinen Anlass für einen Untersuchungsausschuss gibt. Was wir getan haben, das sehen viele Kritiker ist, anders. Das verstehe ich, aber man muss auch die Kompetenz dazu haben. Ja, gibt es denn gar keine Möglichkeit, die Verantwortlichen zur Rechenschaft zu ziehen für die Fehler, die gemacht wurden. Ich bleibe dabei, die Tätigkeit der Troika war ein großer Erfolg. Die Tätigkeit der Troika war notwendig, das sagt auch das Parlament, mit einer breiten Mehrheit. Und die Arbeit der, zur Arbeit der Troika gab es nahezu keine Alternative. Wir müssen die Lehren aus den Fehlentwicklungen, die Lehren aus der Tätigkeit ziehen. Aber äh, rückwirkend muss man sagen, 
Das war die einzige Möglichkeit, die wir hatten und die Erfolge geben uns auch recht. It is exactly this attitude of the regions in Brussels and Berlin that is turning people against this Europe. That's why the Greeks have elected a government which is opposing it. If those governing Europe still refuse to confront their mistakes, they are endangering all the progress which European integration has brought in the last 20 years. Europe used to be a symbol for hope. Now it has become a symbol for despair. Of course, the burden of the crisis could be distributed more fairly. Of course, those responsible could be held to account. And of course, it would be possible after the fiasco of the programs to abandon austerity and create with new investments a future for the crisis countries. Why didn't this happen? We have a lot of, actually, we have a lot of evidence from uh, uh, psychological and sociological studies that say that uh, when someone has strong beliefs um, evidence doesn't change their mind, and in fact, the better informed they are, the more resistant they are to evidence. Uh, so we, it's not too surprising, and it's very, very, very moralistic. People have a, a set of values, and they, if you say, but those values don't make sense in terms of multiplication and, and adding and subtracting, they just get angry. They don't actually change their mind. Having um, unelected, unaccountable, and very often incompetent officials in Brussels taking decisions about um, people to, from which they are detached and to whom they are not accountable doesn't work. So, you know, if you're Angela Merkel, you take policy decisions which impose suffering on you know, Greek people or Portuguese people, and ultimately you're only accountable to German voters. And if you're working for the European Commission, uh, you have a job for life and uh, you're accountable to your boss, but certainly not um, for any suffering you might cause. How it come that these people are in power? Why officials who have no personal interest in this game? It is, it is extraordinary. I mean, how a very narrow ideology yeah. managed to get control of institutions that have had such a huge effect yeah. on the lives of, of millions of people in, in the Euro area and the Eurozone. It is an extraordinary thing. Ideological bias is so difficult to explain. Like How it, it happened they, that they took over the whole commission? I think it's because it was the dominant thinking at the time they were getting their jobs. So that very neoclassical, yeah. neoliberal dom was the dominant thinking, that government debt is bad, that uh, uh, a large state sector is really bad. Mm -hmm. The smaller the state sector, the better. That uh, private sector decisions are always good. Public sector decisions are always bad. That was the dominant sort of ideology when these people got into power and got their jobs. And they're still there. Ago, 20 more. years ago, and they're still there. They have learned nothing. Don't broadcast that. <laughs> <laughs> power without control. That means no accountability to the parliaments nor to the public at large. Those responsible at the IMF, ECB and the EU Commission refuse to answer any of our questions. Mm -hmm.